Thank you so much for coming out. Zeno Project in general is a safe, comfy space for people having difficult psychedelic experiences, difficult emotional experiences, difficult psychological processes, too dusty, too thirsty, whatever. They just need a comfy, safe little bubble to crash in and get a little support in. So if you're here not for the Zendo training, you can awkwardly walk out, but I really encourage you to stay because I think you'll learn something and have a good time. So um, I wanted to start by doing a little grounding slash ungrounding meditation sort of thing because Burning Man is a little bit of both. So everyone can take a little bit, close your eyes, get comfy. Feel the air, feel the dust on your skin, feel how chapped your lips are, how thirsty you might be. You can take a moment to take a sip of water, it's fine. And just imagine yourself landing in the middle of the playa. You open up your eyes, not in real life, in this pretend world, your eyes are still closed right now. You open up your eyes and you look around and all you see are blinky lights everywhere. You, you see blinky lights everywhere and you reach down to try to find a light just so you can see. You reach down and you realize that you are sitting in the middle of the playa completely naked except for your tutu because it is tutu tuesday good job on that <laughs> you realize at this point that you have no idea where your friends are in fact you have no idea what even happened last night minus that weird unicorn art card thing that at some point you jumped onto but but then there was that other distracting blinky thing that you went to and and then there's a man and the temple and I don't even know. I don't even know. Where are you anyway? Okay. Okay, you're a burning man. Why did you come to this place? I don't know. We'll figure that part out later. So you have no light. You have no water. Your lips feel like a cheese grater. That was a quote from last night. <laughs> and you don't know what to do. You don't know who to trust, you don't know where to go, and you just walk forward. And as you're walking forward, you see a beautiful building, and it looks like this building maybe took two months for some hardcore, amazing, beautiful volunteers to actually construct with their bare own hands. Good job, volunteers. So you walk up to this building and you see a, a flag that's right outside of it, and you look, and you try to read it, things are really confusing, it's really hard to read. So you can just pull out, it's a Zen, 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 Zendo, right, the Zendo. You'd heard about this in the porta potties. <laughs> so you walk up into this, this weird constructed Zendo space because that's really your only option. You have no idea where else to go. And as you approach it, you hope, I hope this is the space I'm looking for. I hope this is a safe, comfy bubble of whatever it is that I need. So in the midst of this disorientation, you can't really quite get words out. You don't know what to say, but you approach it and suddenly a person walks up to you and helps guide you into this space. And as you're walking into the space, I encourage you right now to, to take a moment to imagine exactly what you would want in that moment. Exactly what you would want people to say to you. Exactly the type of vibe that you would want to feel. Exactly the number of squishy, fluffy pillows you would want there to be. What kind of supplies you might need. what kind of care you're looking for. What kind of grounding would actually be helpful in this disoriented place in the desert? And 
but I encourage you throughout this entire week of so graciously volunteering your time and your services to, to kind of keep referring back to this state of mind of how disorienting this place can be, how scary this place can be, and exactly the type of bubble that you would want to walk into in such a disorienting experience. So with that, when you come back into your body, you are in a safe space right now. Don't want to leave you in that disoriented realm. And you can slowly open your eyes again and look around and take note that these are the people that are going to be creating those two safe spaces with all of you. And this is a fucking great bunch of people to do that. Holding shit down. <laughs> so, I'm going to start by introducing Sarah Gill, who's an absolute rock star. Sarah's been involved with the Zendo Project since 2012 when it first started. She's helped coordinate the project at festivals all over the world, Africa Burn and Vision Festival in Costa Rica, Lightning in a Bottle in California. She has a private practice psychotherapy um, in Boulder. She is a, a private practitioner psychotherapist in Boulder, Colorado, and is a co-therapist in a study using MDMA to help treat PTSD. She's passionate about helping individuals connect with their purpose and gifts, healing trauma, and becoming the best version of themselves. All really good things. A transpersonal therapist, she also helps people navigate and integrate extreme states of experiences, spiritual awakenings, and non-ordinary states of consciousness. Very relevant. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to Sarah. Hello, everybody. It's so good to see your faces, all of these new faces and familiar faces. Can I get a raise of hands for how many people um, have volunteered with us in the Zendo before? <laughs> wow, awesome. And how many of you are new volunteers this year? Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Wow. So welcome, welcome you all. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come and join us for um, four hours out here in the desert. Um, this is, we have a very unique experience in the Zendo. We, um, so we schedule people for one or two shifts, two eight hour shifts, which is a really long time. And we, when we only schedule people for one shift because we had so many applicants, some people approached us and said, why do I only have one shift? I want two shifts. I want two or I want three shifts. And to me, that was just a testament to the work that we're doing here and how passionate everyone is about this work. And it really touches my heart. It feels like, you know, how many places in the world or even on the playa, people are just like, yes, I want more. Give me more volunteer hours, more, more, more. So thank you all for being here um, and taking time out of your day to be here. Um, I also, can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. Great. I also want to thank uh, this camp, this Something Freaky This Way Foams camp. This is our second year here, and they have taken such good care of us. Uh, last year they hosted the Zendo within the camp. Um, this year we have two locations, one at 915 in D and one at 245 in A. And um, yeah, this is our first year of having two locations, so that's a really big deal. Um, so, thank you so much to this camp. They have fed us, uh, housed us, and helped us, uh, supported this project in so many ways. So, so thank you to the Bronner's family and Something Freaky Camp. Thank you also to our build crew, our amazing build crew that helped build the Zendos in our camp. structure this year. So last year our structure collapsed in the rain and uh, we may do for the rest of the week but this year we have a brand new structure and um, it's beautiful. And we also have a on the other side, on 9 o'clock side, we have a Pacific yurt that we're using as a Zendo and both spaces have um, an auxiliary space that's smaller for critical cases where people might need a little bit more space to uh, to have their experience, to have their journey. So. So thank you to the build crew. I want to also thank uh, my, my co-coordinators, um, Chelsea 
Lene and Shannon. Um, Lene couldn't be here this week. She had a family, um, she had some family medical things coming up she needed to attend to, and so she won't be here this week, and so we're all really missing her. For those of you who know Lene, you know that she has put a lot of her heart um, and mind into this project and really helped to create it and make it what it is today. So I just want to appreciate uh, Lene. And uh, Chelsea, Chelsea Rose, and Theo, our mascot, for helping to just do absolutely everything and make our camp together and oh, so good with logistical things and decor, which is not my strength, decor, no, inner decor, not outer decor. Thank you. Thank you to all our pilots. Um, that are here today. They're actually going to be up talking um, for a portion of this training, so you'll get to see their faces, get to know them a little bit better. And um, all of our ship leads and all of every single one of you, thank you for making this project possible. This is a huge labor of love. We are open 24-7 the entire week. That is a, a lot of work, a lot of shifts, and it's um, not to discount washing dishes, but it's not washing dishes. It's pretty intense emotional work. <laughs> Um, washing dishes can be hard too, but um, it's it's rough, you know. It, it's it can be it can get pretty tough, but it's also incredibly rewarding. And I think that that's why so many people continue to come back every year. I know it's why I continue to invest my heart in this project over and over. So uh, I want to do a quick exercise as we begin here. So what I'm going to invite you all to do is close your eyes once again, and I'm I'm going to say a word. And I just want everyone to just notice what comes up in their minds and in their hearts and in their bodies as I say this word. And just notice, and we're just going to spend a few moments here just noticing. And the word is psychedelic. moments here just noticing what arises in your body, your mind, your heart, any images that come up, any sensations or feelings. An upward charge of warmth and then a vision of a snake. Thank you. States of bliss and incredible states of fear. Incredible states of fear and bliss. Thank you. Taking the filter off. Taking the filter off. exercise is really that there are so many varying uh, experiences, some responses which we might label negative, some which might, we might label positive, often in the same moment or in the same experience. And uh, this is a group of, of people who, you know, often we, we see that a lot of people who come to the Zendo have had both positive experiences, uh, volunteers who come to the Zendo, and yes, but volunteers who come to the Zendo have had both positive and negative experiences, and often have, have, have had negative experiences where they either were helped by somebody and so were inspired to, uh, to 
to pass that forward, to pass that on, or they were in an experience where they weren't helped and they wished that they could have been. So this is a very you know, so select group of, of people. If you can take that out into the world and think of the resonance of the, that vibration of that word psychedelic um, in the ears of anyone who it might come across to be vastly different and inclusive of what you all spoke today. Um, so as we, as we recognize a lot of, um, in most of the world, and much of the world, especially the Western world, there's a dominant vibration of fear around that word, a dominant vibration of resistance and confusion um, and, and misunderstanding. So um, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm illustrating kind of this, this lesson here of the many perspectives, uh, one is that that's a huge lesson that uh, psychedelics teach us is the many perspectives. And one is um, to, just to note that we all have a bias. We all have a bias in relation to everything and in relation to psychedelics. So to name, um, just to name our bias, to name the Zendo's bias. So we're really coming from this place in the Zendo where we have a few beliefs around psychedelics and people's experience on them. Some of those beliefs include that they are relatively safe if they're unadulterated. Many are relatively safe. And, and that there are real risks and that education and dialogue about these risks can reduce the harm that could be potentially caused by psychedelics. So it's important to know our perspective because it's the foundation upon which this work stands and it influences the unique approach that we take to substance use, which is a little bit different than the mainstream approach to substance use as well as to when somebody's having a difficult experience after they've ingested a substance. So psychedelics are ancient healing tools. Is that really loud, the wind? Do I need a wind block? It's okay. okay. Which have been used for thousands of years in many cultures, indigenous cultures all around the world in ceremonial rites, in rites of passage, uh, and in healing use. And as, as we know, in the last hundred years in the West, uh, psychedelics have been revisited and rediscovered in a way. Both plants, such as ayahuasca, psilocybin, cannabis, ibogaine, mescaline, as well as chemical, uh, chemical psychedelics, some which have been created to mimic natural psychedelics and some which have been created to become entire, something entirely new. So um, MAPS is the organization that um, sponsors and that Zendo was birthed out of, that was created out of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, which is a research and education organization that is developing research studies into psychedelics and marijuana internationally. How many of you heard about Zendo through learning about MAPS? Awesome. So, um, so just to, to speak to that, that um, what I was speaking to a moment ago about the bias of the Zendo, one of the, the biases there is that there's potential and that there's potential benefit in psychedelics may not sound revolutionary to everyone here, <laughs> but that's a huge shift in the way of, of viewing these substances and subsequently affects how we deal with people who are having difficult experiences. So um, what I'm going to go into today is just a little bit of the effects of psychedelics, the holistic effects, what can contribute to a psychedelic, um, a difficult psychedelic experience. Um, and then we're going to be talking about the principles that we use within the Zendo. We're going to be having the pilots come up um, and talk about the principles that we use. We're going to be talking about sitter self-care, how to take care of yourself when you're caring for others. And we're going to be talking about ethics, um, how to do this work ethically and responsibly. We're also going to have a couple of our medical leads come up and talk about um, how we work with medical situations in the Zendo, how we handle those. 
And we're also going to have some, some visiting guests. Um, we're going to have some Black Rock Rangers come. And we're going to have um, a woman from Emergency Services Department here at Burning Man to talk about the work that they do on the playa to help keep people safe. So everyone, just please take care of yourself as needed. If you need to get up and go to the bathroom, go ahead and do so. Get up and stretch and move. Um, I know that it can be a long time, even if it's something that is interesting and passionate about. I know that it's, it can be a while. So um, take good care of yourselves. Stretch, breathe. That way. <laughs> So um, just to touch a little bit on the effects of psychedelics right now, we're not going to go too in depth into the individual effects of every single psychedelic out there because that would um, take all day. Um, but what I do want to say is that one of the most amazing things about doing this work in the Zendo is the people that you meet, the volunteers that you meet. And there are so many people here that have such a wealth of knowledge. All of you are coming with your own wisdom as well as your own intrinsic intuition. And I just want to honor everyone, every single individual's own personal knowledge base in this space and honor that any one of you could be up here talking about this right now from a different perspective, from a different angle. So one of the best things that um, to do in the Zendo when it's slow is to talk to each other and learn about everyone's expertise because there are people who are encyclopedias of knowledge who do know every single <laughs> psychedelic and all of their effects. And so... Um, I just feel so grateful to be working with so many people who are holding this wisdom. So uh, a little bit about the effects of psychedelics. We're going to talk a little bit about the mental, mental, physical, and spiritual and emotional effects. Um, so mentally, we can experience visions. We can experience hallucinations. Uh, we can experience... Um, having time differences, feeling uh, out of time, um, completely detached from our ego, completely not aware of our ego self. Um, we can experience confusion and disorientation because of that. So a lot of times people come into the space because they're feeling confused or they're feeling disoriented and that it's causing them to feel fear. Uh, physical sensations, including energy, energetic responses, noticing the flow of energy, feeling energy, um, and as well as physical sensations like nausea, um, breath, and a lot of what we see in the Zendo is, is manifested on the physical level. We see a lot of people really processing through their bodies. So a lot of what we, we do in this space is not always um, talking. So sometimes you might be talking with people and other times you will just be sitting there and allowing the process to happen. Um, well, you're always going to be allowing the process to happen, but sometimes you'll just be sitting there and holding space with the person and you might sit with someone for six hours and never say a single word, depending on what that person needs. Um, so the, the spiritual effects, so many people reporting experiences of past life experiences, experiences of their own death, being in another being, feeling themselves shape-shifting into other animals, entering different, entirely different realms into entirely different dimensions. So um, we often talk about the term psychedelic as mind manifesting. Psychedelic. Be cool if we called it that. Psychedelic. Um, one, one really interesting thing is that the term psyche actually originated, before it turned into mind, it actually originated from, from Latin soul. So psyche has roots in actual soul, so you can also interchangeably use it as soul manifesting. So in the Zendo, we really hold people's spiritual experiences as valid and meaningful for them, and we help them integrate and make sense of those experiences, which can sometimes be incredibly um, beautiful and inc also incredibly disorienting or frightening. So I'm going to go into now what can contribute to a difficult experience. There are so many things that can contribute to somebody um, experiencing difficulty. And we want to also here highlight the difference between someone having a difficult experience and someone else having a difficult experience because of the experience that someone's having. So <laughs> we see a lot of times people come into the Zendo, they're having a great time, but everyone around them isn't. So we attend to, to those people as well. And
and um, the set and setting of the individual's surroundings really are primary when determining how their experience is. So can somebody um, tell me a little bit um, about what set is? internal situation. So what you bring into a trip, you take out of a trip. I like that. Anyone else? Set? Our attitudes and preconceived notions about what the substance might be like are what our attitude might be towards it. That's huge, um, which is largely determined culturally. Right. Your psychological makeup, your previous histi history, trauma, ancestry. Thank you. So, come back up. You guys both just said the same thing. <laughs> Intention setting. And what was the last piece? Great. Your mindset, your intention, what you want to bring into it and out of it. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. So set and setting are really um, off, they're not mutually exclusive, right? So there's some things that really overlap both because as we know, the internal affects the external and the internal is the external. <laughs> um, so yeah, they're both very connected. But, um, and what was the one that you, what you ate? Yeah, what you ate, how well you slept, hydration, nobody cares. I'll just speak for myself. Thank you. Um, so setting, can I get some examples of what setting might be? And a festival you're at, the amount of stimulant that, that's around. Great, thank you. Who you're with, that, that is huge, that is huge. And that's what we see in the space is, you know, a lot of people, um, it's not bad, it's just sometimes people are out there with their friends and their friends just don't want to process with them for six hours. They want to go out and dance and have fun. So it's all about differing intentions, right? So if someone's intention is to go out and have a really good time and then some stuff comes up for somebody and they don't want to hold it, um, the Zendo's a great place to go because we are there specifically to hold that space for them. surroundings. Aesthetics. So yeah, the chance that you would have to might have to deal with something or that there'd be an expectation of your behavior. Thank you. known about the Zendo, which happens, but actually didn't come, is that that's one of the big reasons why they don't show up, or one of the main reasons why people don't go to receive services somewhere is because of the fear that they're going to get in trouble. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Those are all really great examples. Um, so yeah, the festival setting versus the recreational setting versus the research study versus being with a few people or a lot. Um, so in, in a research study, um, such as the ones that, that MAPS is involved in, that MAPS is developing, a difficult experience is not only accepted, but it's welcomed. It's part of the experience. It's part of what um, we know is going to come up, potentially. And that is often the purpose of 
the um, experience, in, when you're doing psychedelic therapy at least, is to help to work on those underlying things that might be coming in. Um, in a festival, it can be the same thing. So at Burning Man, a lot of us come here to experience um, a modern day rites of passage, to transform ourselves, um, to really work on ourselves. And, and with that intention, taking a psychedelic might manifest in a very different experience than someone who's coming here to get away from themselves, right? So it's kind of the difference between checking in versus checking out. Um, because when you take uh, one, of, one of these substances to try to escape yourself, psychedelics often have a way of taking you right where you don't want to go. And that can be really difficult if that's not what you had planned. That wasn't your intention. So underlying trauma that, that you spoke to, underlying familial stuff, underlying mental um, headset, headset, mindset, um, huge, hugely um, influential when it comes to somebody's experience. We'll talk about this a little bit later too, but um, you know, experiences where people uh, maybe are triggered by a psychedelic set off, or they come into the space because not they actually didn't take a psychedelic, but they're actually having their first psychotic episode. So that happens. We do get people in the space um, who have those experiences, and we'll talk a little bit later on about how to work with those. Um, so to go on, to continue on what can cause a difficult experience, um, fear of loss of sanity, fear of loss of control. Uh, for many of us, that fear of losing control, of not being in charge of our own mind can be terrifying. And the difficulty in letting go and surrendering to that experience causes resistance. Um, and there's a phrase that we use in, in, in psychotherapy, which is what we resist persists. So the more you resist something, the more you get it. And it's kind of that law of attraction. The more you resist something, the more energy you're putting into it. And so the more it comes back to you. Uh, one of the factors is um, what a couple people mentioned, which is cultural environment, the cultural environment of fear. So this affects both how the individual is relating to their experience, as well as how the people around them are related to the experience. So what we see often is that when people encounter difficulty or they encounter intense emotion or um, intense energy or movement, that people get scared. And often for those of us who've had experience in those realms, the fear might be a little, might be less or it might be a whole lot less, especially if we're, we're um, doing this type of work and sitting with people. We expect that to come up and we welcome it as part of a process, as, as part of evidence of a transformation that somebody is going through. But if, you're, if you don't have experience with psychedelics or you were engendered, like many of us were, in a culture of, of fear and those things are bad, then it equates with, well, this experience is bad. And so it becomes, this experience needs to stop. This experience needs to be stopped, rather than we need to support someone through this experience. So that sort of approach just adds more resistance to what the person might already be resisting, the difficult emotions, the trauma that's coming up. Um, one of the other pieces here that determines our experience is how we approach emotion as a society. So how we approach psychedelics, but also how we approach emotion. It's a really good story um, that one of my teachers, Martin Prechtel, uh, who's a, a Mayan shaman and indigenous wisdom teacher who lives in New Mexico, talked about in his book on grief. And he talks about how he was with this um, kind of white collar businessman who came to him and said, I can't, I can't grieve, I can't feel emotion, I can't feel anything. And so Martin, uh, as he does, put him through a set of rituals where he had to go to the ocean and give gifts to her and pray and ask for, for um, tears to be um, able to feel, to be able to cry. And so he started feeling more and more emotion and then his mother passed away and he had to go to her funeral and he was at her funeral and everyone was standing around stoic, as many people do at funerals. No, just sad, totally blank, but not too sad. Don't be too sad. So everyone's just standing there. And he just starts wailing and crying and screaming, he starts to throw himself on the ground, um, just writhing around, around all of his puritanical relatives that are just standing there looking at him. And he just doesn't stop. And he just keeps going. And eventually they actually brought the ambulance. 
um, they came and picked him up and they took him to the hospital. And, and later when he, you know, released, when he went through his process, he was totally fine. And they were like, oh, we were so scared. What was going on? You know, and he's like, I was grieving. I was grieving. And Martine says, you, you can't medicate emotion. And you have to feel, you have to allow yourself to feel. So that story to me is always just a, a really beautiful illustration of um, the importance of a feeling and what we do in this space is really just allow, creating a safe space to allow someone to have the experience that they're already having and release the blocks that they're having to, to feel them. So, um, and, and psychedelics, as many of us know, really put us in touch with our emotions um, and really make the unconscious conscious. So we're going to transition now into uh, the four principles that we use in the Zendo to work with difficult experiences. So I'm going to be inviting our pilots up to share a little bit about each of these four principles. And first up, we're going to have Eric. Drug stigma. Quiet. <laughs> Plentiful resources in terms of food and water. Calm and loving. These are all so good. Full of compassion and free of judgment. There's so many hands. Safe. Want people to want to be there. It's a really good one. Physically comfortable, which is a challenge on the playa. <laughs> Natural beauty and unfettered joy. Something with a physical barrier. Lots of comfy pillows. Um, away from law enforcement. Stuff to play with. Somewhere I can express myself. Well, let's do it three more. Confidentiality. I trust the environment. It's okay if I don't want to speak. Ash. Um, soothing lighting. Soothing lighting. All of these are so good. Okay, last one. Herbal tea. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I feel like all of these things will be available at the center in some capacity. Except quietness. Although, I mean, it's pretty hard to find a quiet place on the playa, especially at night. Um, but it's nice that we're kind of, this year, that we're you know, not on the astronaut. We're a little bit uh, tucked away, so hopefully the space will be a little bit uh, quieter than it has in years past. Um, in addition to that, one of the things um, that we have this year, besides having the large gender structures, which can comfortably fit you know, between 10 to 15 guests at a time, and comfortably 15 feet get a little crowded. Um, next to um, both of the structures, the Pacific Gear and the Zendo structure, um, we do have um, a smaller structure that's behind them um, for people who might be a little bit more boisterous, might be a little bit, might need more um, isolation or individual attention. 
um, or something like that so they don't disturb the other guests that are in the Zendo. So it's definitely something that we've added in to kind of make the Zendo feel um, a little bit safer um, when we have multiple guests um, in there. We have some beautiful decor. Thank you, Chelsea, for um, To uh, kind of create a space, we're also going to have food and water and tea. Um, the other thing that we have um, this year that we haven't had in years past is we um, have swamp coolers for both of uh, for both of the structures. So we'll hopefully be able to get some temperature control going um, in the spaces. And really, um, in addition to creating a space, it's really important that if you are volunteering in the Zendo, if you are a sitter in the Zendo, um, that you're really conscious of your own energy um, and your own maybe judgments or triggers sometimes. If you have a guest that you feel that you're getting emotionally triggered by, you can always, and we'll talk about this uh, later in the training, but you can always um, have another sitter come sit with them um, and make sure that there's a good um, therapeutic match between each guest and each sitter. Um, and that's something that the pilots and the um, shift leads will be able to uh, kind of assist you with uh, while you're on shift. So, yeah, I think that's it for creating the safe space. And I think Shannon is going to be our next principal. Thank you guys so much. to direct where this experience is going. And I'm, I'm in the driver's seat if I was guiding. But when I'm sitting, it's kind of like, um, I never did this, but when teenagers do um, driver's ed, I've heard that there's some cars that have two steering wheels <laughs> and two sets of brakes. So if the trainer needs to step on the brakes, they're like, oh, this is not looking good. They can, I don't know if that's just made up or actually happens, but, um, that's how I picture sitting, is okay, you're driving, but I am gonna pull on the brakes if I feel like we're gonna crash. So I, I let there be space for them to drive. Um, each of us have our own path in life. There's no concrete, um, you do X, Y, and Z, and then you're a successful human. Um, we all have to figure out our own path, and I don't know what's best for somebody else, especially if I'm just meeting them. So. We try to create space for people to explore. What is your path? What, what are you learning about your path tonight? What is your path for this evening? What, what would you wish it to be? What, what is it in reality? Um, and sometimes that's verbal, and sometimes that's just kind of energetic. Just, I'm sitting here as a grounding anchor. Um, we have a friend who also couldn't be here, who's a, a sitter. He likes to just sit and meditate with people. So when people are especially not verbal um, and they're in a more relaxed state, they're willing to sit or lay for a while. He just likes to close his eyes and invite them to meditate if they would like to. Um, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, but he asks if it's okay for him to do it for a few minutes. And that's kind of like providing an anchor. Their sailboat is like out in the gusty winds. And sometimes being a sitter is, okay, you can be out there and I'm going to be your anchor. Um, we have to be as sitters really solid so that people can be really out there. Um, and that's kind of counter um, to another thing that I'm going to say, which is 
forget his name, but in the 50s, there was a researcher who did studies with LSD and psycho, um, psychotic patients, and he would do one-on-one -on -one sessions, where he would give LSD to the patient and sit with them. And he would do group sessions with two or three patients and a co-therapist, co um, and everyone would do LSD, including the doctor. And he said that he really liked the group setting better because um, when you're sitting with somebody and you're not on the substance, you don't really know what their truth, what the truth is. They're seeing the truth, and you can only gather what the truth is through what they communicate. Well, we don't take psychedelics when we're sitting with people at the Zendo, um, so please do come to your shift sober. Um, but I like that recognizing that it's not that they're crazy and they're not connected to the truth that I am. It might be that they're seeing the truth and I'm not. So we've got to figure out a way to just translate because their truth doesn't make logical sense if you try to translate it into this realm with you know, English words. Um, so it's kind of being flexible, letting them set the tone of what the language is and what the path is. The last thing I'll say is there's also a balance there. Like I said, having the emergency break as the um, co-driver is people do need structure. That's often why they come into the Zendo. You know, lots of people are out on the playa creating their own path while you know having an experience, but they're coming to us because there's no contain. They're, they're experiencing a moment when they need some more containment. So while we want to allow them to have their path, we need to provide a, a container. So that has to do with what Erica just spoke about safety. Um, and and being aware of what is the emergency break. Okay, we can be loud and move around, but it has to be in this space because there's somebody sitting right here. Um, or, you know, we can go down into the saddest parts, but, you know, if you start feeling like you're going to be suicidal, I'm going to need to maybe call in some support and some help, and I'm going to ask that you please stay here until you're feeling um, more safe. So just kind of creating boundaries, not saying it's not okay to feel that way, but to say, if that should happen, then I'm gonna do what I can to keep you safe. Um, the last thing, I'll, I said the last thing, but I'll say one more last thing, um, which is uh, very simple. I like to make offers, invitations, instead of demands. Um, except for in our most violent situations, which are very rare, we'll talk about those later. Um, it, making an offer, um, allows you to choose how you want to engage with me. So like most of you don't like being told what to do, you might like an invitation. You have to come to this party tonight. You have to. If you aren't here, I'm gonna be mad at you. Hey, there's this awesome party tonight and you're cool and this party's cool. Do you wanna come? You wanna come with me? You're much more likely to say yes when it's a question that you get your own autonomy to say, inside of me, does that feel like what's right for me? So we can do that as a sitter. Would you like to meditate? Yeah, or uh, no, that's the last thing I want to do right now. Okay, we don't have to do that. Let's, let's bring something else out. Thanks. So next up we've got Irina and Jesse, our third psychedelic time reduction principle. I'm Irina. trying to understand the person's experience. Maybe connecting with something in yourself that can relate. Maybe getting a sense of the feelings that are there. And that can mean going into some really difficult feelings in yourself. When you're connecting with their difficult feelings, it can, it can bring up some hard ones in yourself. And so, of course, you only want to go as deeply as you feel comfortable, but um, that's kind of the gist of it. You also want to try to communicate what you're understanding about them. Let them know that you get it. Let them know the feelings that you're sensing. Let them know what you see and feel. 
And then try to stay out of judgment or sympathy. Sympathy is more like, oh, you poor thing, or oh, that, that's really hard, or, um, that kind of thing. You want to more, more just be with them in their feeling, in their experience. The Zendo is really a good space for connection. You know, sometimes when you're all the way out there and you think you're the only one who's ever been there and the only one who will ever go that far out, just having someone else be there with you and stay connected is so important. Um, one thing that I think about is a friend of mine was telling me about how he uh, sat with someone who came in speaking in tongues. It was like, rrr, rrr, rrr. and instead of having a conversation in English, my friend had a conversation in tongues with this person. <laughs> Sometimes you just gotta meet them with where they're at and connect. It doesn't matter what words are coming out of your mouth. I mean, it matters, don't say bad words, but you know, it, it doesn't matter if words are coming out of your mouth. The primary purpose is just to connect and make that person feel held and supported. You also wanna have a, an attitude of curiosity or what they call beginner's mind. Um, so being really open to them and interested and wondering what's going on for them, kind of moving toward their experience instead of away from it. One example I can think of is one of the most entertaining times I had sitting at the Zendo a couple years ago was when somebody really needed to find the perfect porta potty. <laughs> And I mean, it, it, we engaged in it as this like this search for the perfect porta potty, and it was such a curious excursion. You know, we would open one up and go, "Oh no, 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 not that one." We'd open up the next and go, "Okay, okay, that one's good, but it's it's a little wet." So then we start shuffling dust into the porta potty together with this this sense of you know fun too, the sense of like positive, like okay, let's see, let's see where we can go with this. Let's let's go through this with you. Um, yeah, eventually he didn't choose a porta potty and decided he didn't have to pee, but it was a curious <laughs> excursion nonetheless. Something not to do, not to do. Um, using phrases like at least, for instance, well, at least you didn't take Romo Dragonfly tonight. <laughs> Or like, look on the bright side. At least we're at Burning Man, and there's lots of amazing people here, and and yeah, life is good. Don't want to do that. Um, also, minimizing their experience. So I'm like, oh, it's not so bad. Really, it'll be okay. You'll get over it. That kind of thing. Don't deny their experience. You don't have to completely believe it yourself, but you have to believe that this is what they're experiencing. So if someone says that blue elephant in this room is really intense right now. You don't go, I don't see the blue elephant. What are you talking about? You also don't want to over reassure someone. So, uh, you know, it's okay. You'll be fine. You'll get over it. Just, just wait a little bit longer. You'll be okay. Um, your anxiety can start to get in the mix and, um, move away from their experience and uh, in a way uh, deny their experience, which can, can make someone feel really disconnected and alone. And just a reminder that grounding is, is not the same as talking down. So sometimes someone will come in in such an ungrounded state that it is helpful to say, you're at Burning Man, you've taken this, this substance, if you happen to know what substance they're on. So it's not that in that moment you're trying to to contain and talk down their experience, but it, but sometimes like putting a little bit of a parameter on it is is helpful. Okay, so we're gonna do a little skit for you just to demonstrate these two things. We'll start off with what not to do. I'm a sitter in the zendo and. the man. The man's up there. No, I'm the man. No, 
actually, you're a woman and the man's out there. You're gonna burn me tonight. No, 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 they're not gonna burn you. You don't have to worry about that, really. You're gonna be okay. I'm on fire, I feel it. No, no, you're, you're not, you're not, you're okay. You're okay, calm down, you're okay. Hey, 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 hey! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! And take two. <laughs> Hi, come on, sit down right here. What's going on? I'm the man. You are. How, how do you mean? They're going to burn me tonight. It's really scary. Yeah. Oh, geez. Wow. What's that like? I know. I just kind of feel like, like I'm the center of attention, and there are a lot of people looking at me right now, and you know, uh, they're just like trying to light my feet on fire so that they can have a good time without me. Oh, geez. Like you're feeling fire. Oh, and everyone's looking at me too. Oh, wow. That, that, You know, I just, I just kind of feel alone at this burn. Yeah, yeah, I know. Sometimes it feels really isolated, even though there's so many people here. It's, it's my first burn, so you know, it's been kind of rough. Oh yeah, yeah. First burns can be all sorts of things. All this stuff. Can I get some water? Yeah, yeah. Let me get to that came up at all, but we'd love to hear from you. What's that? The man doesn't burn tonight. <laughs> the man doesn't burn tonight. Should I tell it? Hey, we don't even have to worry about it. here, I think, around um, naming feelings and when is an appropriate time to do that. In this skit, I might have kind of jumped to that, um, where maybe she wasn't feeling scared or like it was terrible. Maybe she was feeling some other things. So you might want to kind of hold off on putting names to the feelings until you get a real sense of them and maybe until they even put them in their own words. Yeah, maybe you could ask what feelings are there. staying with the experience and about reading it, reflecting it can be good. Okay, we should probably wrap up now. Thanks, everyone. with that word bad, bad trip. I know I still talk about 
my mushroom experiences as, as that. I, I still have that habit of talking about that, that bad trip I had last night. It was so difficult. It really takes me down to a deep, dark kind of pit in myself. But just noticing the, that moralistic tone and even just holding that within yourself while sitting with guests can really, um, cha it really changes the setting. So trying to uh, keep the idea of challenging experiences often winding up being some of our most enlightening, some of the most uh, growth promoting and learning experience that we have come from difficult experiences. So also considering that this might all be happening for a reason and trusting that there's a process here that the immediate moments might be really difficult but there's something maybe taking you down into, into a hellish place but that's, that's part of it. Um, and so a lot of times guests don't come in with that understanding. They, they might have it. They might be fresh off the Vipassana retreat or what have you, but they might also have just taken LSD for the first time and uh, someone told them it's okay to start with three or four hits. <laughs> so they're not coming in all the time with their most grounded, centered self. And so it's good for the, the sitters to, to hold that attitude first, to sort of hold the containment in themselves first start with their own beginner's mind and have an attitude of receptivity that they they have a home. They have an emotional home in you as the sitter. They can bring the darkest part of themselves in and you're going to be there to hold it. You're not going to shy away. Um, and that can be counterintuitive in, in our culture. Um, you, there's not a lot of reinforcement for negative experiences. Uh, or I, I think you can take it to uh, a certain extent, but then it goes no further, you know, socially or even even physically, you know, biologically, we have all these reflexes. If you touch a hot stove, you pull back, you retract, you protect yourself, and it's a really important function, and you want, you want to hold uh, the idea of that, but then at the same time, remembering that, again, that there's so much to, to grow from these experiences, and uh, I think about friends, you know, you, you go out with friends, you come to Burning Man to have a good time. So you might get the message if you start to spiral down that, hey, cheer up, we're here to have a good time. It's not, not something that you wanna, you wanna hold uh, in the Zen You're trying to create a, a container for something different to happen. And remembering that a lot of times a, a breakdown, a supposed breakdown can lead to a breakthrough. So again, some of, some of the most growth promoting experiences. Um, and unconsciously or unconsciously, we, we, we have to keep coming back to this idea. We, we, we've been so instilled on an unconscious level, I think, to avoid negative experiences. Um, so again, you, you know, don't experience the loss. Don't, don't get dark now. Don't experience that. Stop, stop acting sad. You're always so damn sad. Um, so, I don't know. Has, has anyone seen the movie Inside Out? It's such a great experience how sadness ends up becoming the hero. She ends up saying, it's spoiler alert, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I was supposed to start with that. But, um, anyways, it's still a great movie. But, you end, you end up seeing that a, a mixture of complex emotions is what's most important, including sadness, anger, darkness. And um, again, we don't come across that wisdom all the time with, with our friends or the default cultures that we come here from. So it's really a central part of what we're trying to hold here. Something like that, um, having 
going through the process that creates kind of new growth edges for you, um, gives a lot of space for self-reflection, self-discovery, um, and new depth that, that you maybe, um, maybe wasn't possible in kind of the, the way that, that things have been going. Um, so you know, kind of imagine how transformed you were by that experience. And you know, it's really easy um, to be able to just because, you know, because of the way that our you know, culturally programmed we are, um, to not sit with the sadness or the pain or the loss, and you know, you see it when you kind of jump to a new relationship or something like that, and just kind of um, ignore the a lot of the, the opportunities that you have um, for growth there. Um, and yeah, and even thinking about you know the process of of when you're building muscles, um, we, we break down parts of our muscles to allow new growth edges to rebuild um, and you know, really creates a new space for a new type of strength. Um, so kind of looking at it. So back to the darkness. We have shamanic cultures, tantra, have alchemy traditions, east and west, all really covering these ideas. And um, so a lot of times, just holding that idea that the dark, holding holding the space for something dark to come up, can create the shift in and of itself. Coming in and, and just mirroring the person or saying, yeah, that, that is difficult. You're having a really hard time. You can see a shift happen right there. And maybe it might not, but it's it kind of fuel for something later or part of integration. That there's there's something there that they can embrace. And along with the, the alchemy tradition, uh, there's this idea of the negredo. So going down, down into the, the blackest of black, and the darkest of dark within you. And um, how that can kind of lead, also Dante's Inferno is a good example of it. How going down into hell can be the way to come back up through into a more balanced place. Also, kind of thinking about um, the, the concept of suffering being um, thinking about it as pain or difficulty combined with resistance, um, and, and when you're when you allow yourself to just kind of be present with the pain um, and, and let go of letting go of the, the resistance, um, being able to sit with the experience without judgment, um, being present with what is, um, and, and this is something where a sitter can really come come into play. Um, this perspective can really start with the center. We can kind of hold that attitude of acceptance, and in the same way that we were talking about um, the setting, the um, the people that you're around, and how that kind of um, influences your environment, your experience. Um, having a sitter who is really grounded and really present, and also helping you know, sit without judgment and, and acceptance. Um, can be, you know, oh, sorry. Um, and, and, and so with all that being said, um, it's really important to remember that there are also, you know, there are difficult experiences that are important that we can grow from. And then there are also, um, so, you know, we, we touched on um, that there could be medical concerns um, and, you know, that it's important to, to be aware of the context and conditions that your guest has come to visit, you know, their, their past history, um, maybe, you know, what, or not maybe, but what, what they have have taken, um, and if you take all those things into consideration, we'll talk a little bit more about you know, how to assess medically if you have you know, medical um, volunteers that are on every shift as well. Um, but, you know, just important to, to allow space that the, the difficult experience is very important and transformative, but also just be aware that you know, there, there are times where you know, medical would need to step in as well. Thank you to all of our pilots. So all, all of you are going to be seeing these faces um, quite a lot during the week. Um, all of these pilots have been, um, veteran volunteers with the Zendo and um, are really experienced. Some of them are therapists um, are just really good sitters and they're going to be um, helping to 
to drive the ship, so to speak. Um, so if you have any questions uh, during your time, during your shifts, um, please come to one of us. One of them will always be on your shift, in addition to a shift lead who will also be there. Um, so thank you so much for talking about our principles. <laughs> Quick question, are Dooney, Dan, and Peaches in the house anywhere? The Rangers, Dooney, Dan, and Peaches? So um, just to let you all know, in a little while, like half an hour, we're going to be having a quick 10 minute break. You guys can get out, stretch, go use the bathroom, um, and we're gonna have some snacks too. Yep. There will be time for questions at the end. Yeah. Um, so in those principles, we really covered a lot um, of territory as far as different ways that we can work with difficult experiences. Uh, and here I just want to note um, certain experiences that might require additional assistance. Um, the first one is people who are aggressive or violent. So a lot of times um, aggression or violence can be re related to so many things, can be related to underlying um, mental space, can be related to type of drug, um, dosage, it can be related um, to trauma. There's so many, so many things that can um, contribute to someone uh, exhibiting, you know, violence or aggression um, or extremely disruptive behavior. So just to touch on the way that we work with that in the Zendo. So at a lot of festivals um, that we attend, uh, Envision Festival in Costa Rica, Africa Burn, Lightning in a Bottle, um, the way that we work with medical um, and security is, is very close. We're triaging with them. We have medical and security and Zendo all right next to each other. And so part of our goal is to really help integrate harm reduction services within the emergency services departments that already exist um, at festivals. And so this often works really, really well. So when somebody does get maybe too aggressive for us to really handle, we have security guards who, many who come to our trainings, as well as have their own background in training, um, who, who are committed to helping work to de-escalate situations before um, res resorting to um, meeting aggression with aggression, so to speak. Um, so we found that that's one of the best ways to work with it, and so one of the tools that we really use in the space is de-escalization. Uh, and that can be very um, energetic. So if someone is exhibiting violence or aggression, um, obviously it's really natural for us to have a fear response. So it's not about not having that fear response, but it's about honoring that that's there, and then doing our best to remain a calm and grounded presence. If it's impossible for you to do that, that's fine, that's okay. Honor where you're at um, and kick it sideways. Give it to somebody else who might feel a little bit more up to the task of handling that type of energy. Um, because depending on the time of day or the time of your life, or um, you may not want to be dealing with that kind of energy there. Um, so if you don't feel equipped, step back, bring in somebody else, bring in a shift lead, bring in a pilot who can handle those kinds of situations. We never ever want our volunteers to be put in danger. So our um, chain of process is, if it's possible to help that person um, but uh, not hurt themselves or hurt other people through directing their energy, we don't do restraint. Sometimes we do bear hugs, that's okay. <laughs> but we don't restrain people. Um, so if, if you can, to try to de-escalate and move that person away from those kinds of situations, away from other types of people, away from dangerous objects, that's our first response. Our second response is, is if that seems impossible, then we move other people away from that person. We get other people back. So as many of you might have noticed, when an emergency happens or when a crisis happens, our immediate tendency, in, so beautifully, is to help. So we come in and we try to help. And sometimes what that can do is too many people come in, it can actually escalate the situation even more. You're adding more energy into the system. Um, so what we try to do in, in instances where people are um, having issues de-escalating is we try to move other people away from them uh, if we can't get them away from other people. Um, another issue that we run into is um, underlying mental health um, issues. People do come into the space. Uh, we do have a few psychiatrists who are in our core team, but in the center we're not offering therapy. Um, we 
call what we do peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, so what we do as far as 5150s or um, you know, a psych psychiatric evals is very limited. We don't do that. Um, what we do is we communicate with emergency services, we communicate with medical, we get crisis intervention teams to come and help us out in situations like that. And we have a number of cases, a couple usually at every event, um, where somebody comes in and we think they're on something and then one of their friends comes and says, no, they're actually not on something, this is how they've been all week, this is how this has been slowly building. So those instances do arise, and it can be tricky to determine because often you have to wait until the course of a normal psychedelic journey to determine whether or not they're really going to come back or not. Um, so in those situations, um, we have other um, we have other emergency services departments that we communicate with that we triage with. Um, so to lead into that, our third um, our third situation requiring additional assistance is um, a medical situation. So in um, after the break, we're going to be having um, a couple of our volunteers come up and um, talk about how our, our medical protocol. Um, but right now, what I would like to do um, is invite up Kate Ganella, who is, um, she is with ESD. Um, she is which is the emergency services department. And um, she is going to, sorry, uh, she's the administrative chief, and um, she has helped, helped us at the Zendo by strengthening our access to medical support. And so she's here to, to share a little bit about ESD and what they do here on the playa to help keep uh, everybody safe. So we're now working uh, via the state of Nevada with a full licensure for all of our people should we need to use it. We don't actually exercise that right now. What we do now is um, is uh, provide BLS care, but in the case of a mass casualty incident or something like that, we'd be able to, to fully utilize all of our people. Um, we have about 60 people in our mental health uh, branch, and, and uh, Sarah was talking about that, how you all will um, have the opportunity uh, to use those people, and I believe you're using MERS, right? So, um, should you need our people, uh, medical or fire or mental health, um, you would call via the MERS radio, radio to the to the 911 dispatch, which is channel five on your MERS radio, and they would send somebody out to all of you. Our um, our mental health branch includes uh, people that are social workers. We have people that are uh, marriage and family marriage family and child counselors. We have, uh, I think, three people who can do a legal 2000 evaluation, and that's uh, like a 5150 in California. It's a, it's a, it's an evaluation of whether you're safe uh, with yourself or with others. Um, we have an agreement now uh, for the last two years, this year and last year, with a company out of Reno that can that Burning Man pays to have the person brought down to Reno if they need something beyond what we can give them here. Um, let's see what else. Uh, we also, our mental health team also, we have a, a, a really strong SADV program. For the first time this year, anybody who finds themselves in a situation where they have been sexually assaulted, uh, we, uh, it's determined that they need to have a SART exam down in Reno, which is the, the closest place that you can get one. Uh, we now, Burning Man is paying to have them flown down uh, to Reno and then flown back into the city if this is where they want to come back to. Hey, Ellen, you know, let me just like, because all of, I know a lot of people here probably wonder about why, why don't we have SART here right on the playa? 
and, and it's actually, you know, we've talked about it for years. This is a really big deal. We care a ton about it. And our person who run our sit chief, the person who's in charge of all of our crisis intervention, is probably one of the biggest advocates I've ever met for, for survivors of sexual assault. And so she has been really adamant about this because in Reno, in the state of Nevada, there are only two places to get a SART exam. So if you have a sexual assault in, say, Elko, you get shipped all the way to Reno um, because they want to make sure that the, the um, chain of evidence is, is uh, the integrity of that chain of evidence is, is not disrupted at all. And they want to make sure that the people who are going to be going into the into the courtroom and having that conversation about what they found with the with the judge, those people are respected by the judge. They know who they are. They they they, they need to know that it's not somebody that came from you know Florida or something that they don't really recognize. There's all kinds of reasons. These tiny little nuances here in the state of Nevada where they found that if they have that that continuity, that consistency, it really helps the the uh, survivor. Uh, to uh, have, um, that it makes it so that it's more likely that there's going to be a conviction. So then Bernie's, Bernie Man's commitment was, okay, let's get them down there quickly then instead of having them uh, sit in the back of a vehicle for hours and hours. And so um, we're hoping that's, we're hoping not to have any of them this year, but if we do, we're going to make sure we take good care of those folks. Um, we also have a child resource center. Uh, uh, that we and, and this is a place where we can watch children while their parents are being detained, um, or a place where when if somebody finds a child, we have a place to keep them. And it's got children's toys and air conditioning, and it's it's a nice little space. It's it's another uh, really awesome agreement that we've made with uh, Pershing County, and uh, we're really excited about being able to do a lot of things more legitimately this year in uh, uh So when it comes to what you guys are doing, uh, we. You know, it's taken a long time. We've, we've been talking to Zendo for a long time about all of this. Uh, there's been this sort of a uh, real dotted line relationship between us and Zendo. And so this year, back in April, I think it was, Lene and myself and Charlie Dolman, the event director, and Tool, the, the uh, lead for Rangers, we all got together and talked about how we could change our relationship with Zendo and really enhance it, uh, really actually bring bring you in, not actually into emergency services and into the organization, because then you'd have to go to all the meetings and that would really suck. So we call it meeting man now. All the people work for burning man. <laughs> so um, so what we thought that maybe the better thing to do would be to, um, to figure out ways that we connect really well, like looking at um, at harm reduction, harm reduction being such a big thing that you guys do, and so we started to have conversations with BLM about harm reduction. Now that doesn't go so well, they're a federal agency, they don't really, you know, whereas, whereas the state of California is sort of open to harm reduction, they're very open to harm reduction. We're talking all the time about, you know, how to treat people on a campus and, you know, all about consent. There's all of this stuff that we talk about all the time. It's so. That, that, that really advocates for the person advocates for a positive experience. Not so. It's not. It's not a. It's not an easy discussion to have with BLM because they uh, they, they think differently. And they're, they're wonderful people. We've been having great conversations with them, but we're, they're, they're not quite there yet. So the harm reduction is more about. It, it, it's less about saying if you take drugs. Uh, here's all the great ways to to, to um, help those people out. It's it's we're more having those those beginning harm reduction conversations with them, like how to how to create um, little brochures and things like that. So we're working on it. Our communications department has been working really heavily with them to help them to understand that that the prevention aspect with, of harm reduction is so powerful. You can't stop people from taking the drugs, but you certainly can do a lot of things to prevent that experience from being the poor one. So. Uh, we're hoping over this next uh, calendar year, with the uh, with our, our enhanced relationship with BLM, that this year is going to that this next year is going to be something that is going to allow for far more um, you know things in the greeter packets. Uh, speaking to what you guys do, um, a much more openness by the BLM to to the kind of work that, that Zendo and other groups on the playa are doing. Mm -hmm. Anybody have questions?
said that he's really glad that there's a lot more cooperation and communication. It has been a, a big year. I'm sure most of you have been reading the newspapers and or re reading the internet about all the things that have gone down. It's been a it's been a, a year, you know. It's been wild. But the thing is, is we got a, a lot of awesome people that come to Burning Man. We got a lot of, a lot of amazing people, super smart people that work for Burning Man, and uh, and we rose to the occasion. And uh, and we have uh, made a, just a huge effort to to be um, their friends, to, to work with them instead of um, in, in that sort of, and it was never antagonistic, it was just that you guys do your thing, we'll do our thing, and now we're doing things together, and, uh, and they're really, they're rising to the occasion too, it's been really awesome. Yeah, we have a we have a great group of, of people in our well our whole my whole department is awesome. <laughs> but our mental health folks they really they, they they've got it. They do they work all year long, they meet monthly and uh, and then up here every day and they're a good group. So thank you all for giving that feedback. It's awesome. So he's asking um, if if you do if, if you do harm reduction for uh, people taking psychedelics, if you do what Sendo is doing for all of these folks, does that essentially uh, are, are you essentially advocating for it? You know, and we've had that question a lot. Um, we actually, when we speak with BLM, uh, we, we've been talking about that because they they say to us, well, you know, how do we know that you're not an advocate? Burning Man isn't an advocate for taking drugs if you're left, if you're offering. The, the kinds of services that you are to help people to deal with their experience with those drugs. Um, that's what harm reduction is all about. And so a lot of what we've been doing with, with BLM and with other agencies is helping them to understand that we don't advocate for it, but if you can make that experience better for that participant so that they don't go off the deep end, so they don't end up in an ambulance or end up in the back of a police car because there wasn't anybody there to help them to gently uh, go through that experience and come back to where they need to be. Um, what you guys are doing is is really making that difference for those people, so that they're so that they're not falling down into the rabbit hole. So we're, we're really trying to educate um, our our law enforcement partners that by by giving these people this kind of a of a um, of a of a resource, it's it helps to change their experience. We're not saying go out there, you know, now that we brought you down off of this, go off and take some more stuff, you know. That's not your job. That's not what you guys are doing here. Um, and that's not what we're doing here either, but we certainly want to make the experience as, po as positive as possible. And I know, um, I don't know, I wasn't here for the whole thing because it was on the radio, but I know in ESD, when we're working through that with people, like even when people come in for a Band-Aid or something, you know, one of the first things we do is have that conversation with them about radical self-reliance and taking good care of yourself. And it's your responsibility also to be the one taking care of your experience out here. It's not our job to be to be babysitting or mommying you. So, of course, you can't have that conversation in the middle of that experience. <laughs> so, anything else? Any more questions? Thank you, thank you. Oh, oh, yeah. And Lene and I, you know, she's seen ours, and I saw hers, and we kind of looked at, that's not a really kind of kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, we looked at each other's protocols, and, uh, oh, God. <laughs> um, so anyway, she she and I have, have looked at it, and they're, they're really similar. We're, do, we're doing the same thing, so it's really exciting to, to have uh, a real similar strategy to how we how we uh, walk through the other end of these things. So yeah, you guys have talked about that.
never thought that I would settle into one Burning Man camp. So I was always that person who would like hop around every year to finish shoes or something. And until I found Camp Soft Landing, um, we're located at 915 and E this year. Come visit us. It's a block away from the other Zendo. And Camp Soft Landing has Planque Norte, a psychedelic speaker series, which is rad. But my favorite part is the Full Circle Tea House, which is open 24-7 during Burning Man. And it was created by and is run by Annie Oak, who is absolutely incredible. She is supreme goddess, so <laughs> grounding, real, warm, welcoming, just holds everything down in place. Like whenever I see her, I'm like, everything is okay now, <laughs> starting now. Um, so Annie has been um, in this role of creating safe spaces and is going to come up here and share with us a little more about the tea house and how we can also use the services of the tea house uh, throughout our time on the playa. Many of you have not been to the Full Circle Tea House or Camp Soft Landing, you're welcome to come drink tea with us. We're at 9.15 and E this year, across the street from the satellite Zendo on the 9 o'clock side at 9.15 and D. And we're really delighted to have everybody there. I um, had the great pleasure of working with the MAPS volunteer crew at the Sanctuary Space in Center Camp many years ago which is run by the Rangers. And um, after about uh, 15 years on the playa, it seemed to me that there weren't really enough spaces out here on the playa for people to rest and rehydrate and be in a community space and receive something as simple as a cup of tea, which is a very grounding experience for a lot of people, to simply sit and be served or to choose to serve other people, also a very grounding experience. So um, about five years ago, together with a group of really wonderful people, we formed the Full Circle Tea House out here to offer a place that did not serve alcohol or play loud music, but offered tea and a place to rest, a safe place to sleep. We give away water, we give away a lot of water, and um, a place where people could be in community and not feel alone. I think a lot of people come here and even though there's thousands, tens of thousands of people here, it's sometimes easy to feel alone out here and disconnected. So it's a place where people can come and connect with other people, receive support and compassion, hydrate, rest, have a nice cup of tea, meet their friends, it's evidently become a popular date destination for people who don't want to go to a bar to have a quiet conversation with someone they first met and want to get to know a little bit better. We um, also are really delighted to be able to serve the Build Group community. Uh, we operate 24-7. We've been out here since Tuesday, and we've been serving since uh, Friday morning. We have an amazing, wonderful crew of people who are camping with us this year, including many Zendo volunteers. And um, if people feel called to serve tea with us, they're welcome to come. We do six hour shifts around the clock. You can come to the tea house and sign up for a shift on our whiteboard and we will serve, serve you tea and encourage you to come and learn how to serve tea with us. We recruit kind, compassionate, grounded people who can really look somebody in the eye and offer them a cup of tea and a moment of connection. It seems like a really simple thing, but it's a very effective way to offer a form of preventative care, to offer a connection and a place where people might be having a difficult moment and with a little care can avoid a more difficult moment. We've also made the um, Zendo available uh, to people in the tea house, of course. We've been working since the Zendo was formed four years ago in collaboration with the Zendo crew to take people from the tea house to the Zendo space for more care and one-on-one -on -one assistance. 
and then offering the tea house as a space to the Zendo volunteers for people to come and integrate, hydrate, rest, and reconnect after their Zendo experience before they go back out onto the playa. So you're welcome to bring people who you feel would benefit from that experience to the tea house for that kind of integration and rest and care. It's also a great place for an afternoon nap. We do a lot of power napping there in the afternoon. And, um, and we really encourage people to keep their eyes open also inside the tea house for folks who might need assistance. We refer people out, as I said, to the Zendo. We also work with the people at the nine o'clock medical unit. We always ask to be sighted near the nine o'clock medical unit, the nine o'clock keyhole. We work with the SD. We work with the crisis intervention team. We've called them in to assist us. We work with the Green Dot Rangers, some of whom are in our camp. And uh, we have received really great support this year from all of those groups in, uh, in assisting us with people who need that kind of care in the tea house. So I'm really pleased that there's uh, such a great level of integration among all the services here and support. And we welcome you to come drink tea with us and uh, learn how to serve tea. If you'd like to serve tea in your own camp, we now have five other tea houses that have been formed from our tea house that exist in other parts of the world. And if you would like to uh, start a tea house of your own, we try to do it in as simple and direct a way as we possibly could, and we'll encourage you and uh, help you form your own tea house if you'd like to do that. We go to many other festivals and events, private parties throughout the West Coast. We have a sister tea house in France that serves wine and cheese because they're French. <laughs> One in Austin, Texas, one in New York City. And if you'd like one in, in your town, uh, we would love to assist you in creating one. So come drink tea with us. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Uh, so we're about to take a little break, but before that, we're going to have Kinthia come up and talk a little bit about scheduling. Kinthia, the goddess of scheduling, who has somehow made this all work. show you what the schedule looks like in its more full color form. Um, there are four of these this year. We have a lot of people as you can see. Yay! It's a lot of people. There are a lot of shifts. Um, there are a lot of different parts to every shift. Um, it's a lot of information and it's difficult for us to explain to everybody that's new how it works and what you're really committing to until you're here and you're like, oh, whoa, eight hours, twice, that's that's hard, that's far, you know, all these things. And so um, we'll work with you to deal with um, any issues, but I just want to um, make sure that everybody understands the basics um, so you know what your roles are. You, you've already been looking at the sign sheet. Hopefully you have um, an understanding of which one of the roles that you have. Um, um, I'll be talking to all of you. I'm working on, I know it was confusing a little bit. Some of you got confused during the process when you were submitting your scheduling. And I appreciate your feedback, so keep sending it to me. I'm making it better and better every year. Um, but I just want everyone to see um, yeah, how much information it is and just to understand that we do need to prioritize the shifts that are still open. Um, the, there are, even though there's this many people um, and everyone did not get assigned two shifts, um, we don't have very many open shifts except there are medical shifts. I'm going to be working directly with the medical people because a lot of them didn't know their schedule until the end and we're getting some more, so don't worry about those. But otherwise, um, the open shifts are only really on the weekend um, and burn night, 6 a.m., all the times when you didn't want to work. Um, and so if you didn't get scheduled for another shift, we'll, um, we're strategizing about that. Uh, we need to focus on filling our first priorities first 
So this is a bad example. I just pulled one out because that's actually the beginning and it does have everything. Um, but yeah, you can see there's some open shifts. These, these are the burn nights later in the weekend. Um, the yellow shifts are open. Um, yeah, and I'm going to have these in the back at the end at 2.30. We're all going to, after you guys break out, if you have a scheduling issue, if you have a shift that you want to get rid of, um, if you need another shift, come there. But I'm going to be starting by focusing on the, you know, the holes that we have and on giving pe everyone at least one shift um, because we have more volunteers than we expected, and which is awesome. Um, but we want to make sure everybody has at least one shift first, at least one sitter shift. Um, I want to give a shout out to the people who did volunteer to be log keepers and breeders. Um, we know that you're all here because you want to have an experience being sitters, and, and it's awesome to be all here too. Um, but it's important for us to have paperwork, and it's important for us to have people at the door that are friendly and welcoming and just you know able to focus on that. And so um, thank you if you uh, agreed to take on those roles. If you only got assigned one of those roles, we will work hard to make sure you also get another sitter shift. Um, but just so everybody can hear, just part of the fun of being at the shift is just being together and meeting everyone and doing all the different parts. So the more people who are willing to do those parts, the easier we can spread it out and the less likely it is that anybody's going to get stuck only doing that. So um, in the future, you know, just watch those. If you think you can do those, please be willing to step up. Um, I'll be committed from now on to making sure we only give one, one of those shifts to people to honor that. But um, it's, a, it's, a fun, it's a fun part of the job too, I think. And some, some people agree, but I guess I'm, I'm just French spreadsheet person. <laughs> but um, anyway, sorry I'm babbling. I was collecting all of this right before I went and got up here. Um, but yeah, so the main thing is if you did have an issue, I'll be at the end. Come up and see me if you know it. And if you just want to pick up another shift, hang out after that. And we are going to be offering, so we're going to be padding the shifts. Like we said, we think, uh, um, we try to guess about how many people we need each shift and it's really hard especially because it changes every year. Um, and we just don't want people to be totally bored. And so that's why we don't just sign up 100 people for every shift. But at the same time, we want everyone to have a chance to participate. And we acknowledge that part of the fun is being there and just hanging out and meeting the other volunteers and having a chance to, you know, and, and, we, and we never know. So we'll probably, we'll start with the overnight shifts and then the early morning shifts and sort of work through and sort of pad the shifts out until you can be like back up, you can come, you can check in. We might, and if it's really, really slow, the pilot on duty can send people home early, um, but we'll get everyone a chance to come at, at some time so you can at least you know participate a little better and, and see it a little more and then we'll be improving the process again next year so that we can continue to grow and fold more people in. So thank you very much. We have longtime Zendo volunteers Cole Marta and Andrew Penn, and they're going to review basic medical assessment tools. Uh, we have a medical volunteer on every shift, like we were saying, and they're in charge of assessing guests and making a call if need be to triage uh, in the event of a medical emergency. But just so, so everyone knows, we don't offer medical care in the Zendo beyond just basic first aid. If a situation arises where a guest is in need of a medical care, we'll communicate directly with the emergency services department via radio and uh, dispatch someone to the Zendo. So Cole and Andrew will now give us a little rundown and familiarize everyone with the Zendo's medical protocol. So thank you to all of you that are here. I couldn't do this without you. Can you hear me okay? No. All right. Closer? Is that better? All right. So in the default world, I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. And I want to make it real, I want to briefly go over what we do with um, medical issues in the Zendo. One thing's really, there's the two things I want you to remember. One, we're not a medical facility. Two, to use your common sense. So what, the reason why we have medical people there is I, I had, has anybody had the experience of, of dying on psychedelics? Yes, many of them. So one of the what, one of the insights that I, I, I got from this experience that I had once was that you have to take care of the vessel, right? And body mind separation put that aside. You have to take care of the vessel. So what we want is we want everyone to get home to their safe to their port, right? and that's what we're here for. So some basic simple things about first aid, medical issues in the Zendo. If you are a sitter, so each shift will have a medical lead. Some of these medical leads will also be your shift leader. So some people are wearing two hats. Everybody should get, every guest should get eyeballed by the medical lead at some point. 
preferably early on in their tenure in the Zendo. Um, Cole's going to talk a little more specifically about that. Um, if you, as a sitter, have any concern, if your gut is telling you something is off with this person medically, ask your medical lead for advice. That's what we're here for. Okay, so low threshold for asking. Please ask. That's why we're here. You know, the biggest issues that we're dealing with here, as far as medical issues, are not likely to be drug induced. There are some possible scenarios that we're going to talk about, but mostly they're environmental. So, who here peed at the break? Not Woo! enough of you. Okay? So, I'm a nurse. If it comes out of your body, I want to know about it. If you haven't peed yet since you woke up this morning, you are not drinking enough water. It's good chance most of our guests have not been drinking enough fluids either. Okay, if you're distracted by the opening of the wormhole in the universe, you're probably going to forget about your camelback. Okay? So, as a sitter, one of the things you can gently do is offer people water and electrolytes. We have both of those things in ample medicine. Most of you probably could describe dehydration for me, because you've been out here for a few days. So, obvious things like dry mouth, a chapped lips. The weird thing about dehydration is that you can stop getting thirsty. So somebody who's not thirsty, or somebody who can't seem to stop drinking water, both of those extremes should be of concern. Right? So again, trust your gut. If something feels off, flag it for person, that's what we're there for. If somebody's getting faint, we're gonna do questions at the end, I think, because we got a real short schedule here. Um, so if somebody is faint or dizzy, again, red flags. Okay? Um, so, we are under this delusion that we kind of know what people took when they came to see us because they took a white powder. Literally dangerous in a medical situation. Um, <coughs> opiates, heroin, uh, Oxycontin, things like that. So, um, you know, as much as we, it's, it's hard to come out here and dedicate yourself to help your fellow peers and not be able to help them, but we're really not equipped to do that and it's, doing them a disservice to try to, you know, save them uh, in a situation that we're not prepared to handle. So let them uh, fight another day uh, if they're in those particular situations. And that said, um, we really need, especially the first shift, uh, to set that boundary with even some of our other services here. If they bring somebody who is just passed out drunk or you know, hardly conscious, um, we need to contact the, the medical and get them over there because uh, that's a medical situation and we're really not set up for that. Uh, and, it, and it helps all of your fellow medical colleagues uh, in future shifts if that boundary has already been established and that's being communicated clearly with the other services. Um, we had a couple of assessment uh, tools that we were gonna go over, but maybe we'll save that for the, the medical meeting afterward. We we're just gonna kind of go over uh, how to check pulse and the importance of that, because that could be a sign of uh, increasing dehydration that um, is getting to be a little more severe. Um, I'm sorry? Eat the mic. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, um, emerg emergency medical attention is required if somebody is showing confusion or disorientation. Uh, it takes quite a bit for somebody to forget their name, um, no matter how intoxicated they are on anything. Most people can remember their name and that they're at Burning Man. Uh, if they aren't even answering the questions that you're asking, if they're not even giving you someone else's name, then uh, that's, that could be an emergency. Um, severe headaches, sluggishness, uh, obviously seizures, which is a pretty dramatic thing to witness, uh, that won't go unnoticed. Um, anybody with difficulty breathing or chest pain or abdominal pain, or if they haven't urinated in the last 12 hours, those are things as far as for the medical uh, leads to know that we need to send those to a higher level of care. Um, how to refer to the emergency services, we're all gonna uh, maybe it's best uh, at each sign out for everybody to make sure that the next team knows how to use the MERS radio and contact to know what channel, for example, ESD is on. Um, let's see. 
Oh, final thing uh, about mandatory reporting. Um, if we get, uh, you know, a report of a sexual assault or somebody is suicidal or homicidal, um, domestic violence, uh, those are all things that we have to also pick up to a higher level of care. And that's the uh, CIT, and I forget what the crisis intervention team, I didn't forget. All right. And I think that that's it. Thank you guys so much for listening. For a quick question. Um, yeah, you know, something like that is sort of beyond our ability to assess in the Zendo. So if we're getting to that level of question, we need to kick that up to emergency services. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, things that if, if we can't. We don't have the ability to do diagnostics and things like that. And we're not, again, we are not a medical facility. I think that's really important to understand. We have medical staff there to make more nuanced triage decisions, but we're not there to actually treat medical problems. So the question you're asking is a good one, but it's sort of getting beyond getting to a level of care that we're not really prepared to start delivering. Any other questions? Yeah. So in the Zendo, um, we call, what we're doing is mandatory reporting in the Zendo. So if somebody um, expresses ideation, uh, the first thing to do as a sitter is to come to the shift lead. And if the shift lead is still uncertain, to go to the pilot and ask the pilot. Um, because yeah, there's a lot of gray area there. But we do take it incredibly seriously. Um, so if there's any ideation, I tried to do this, but I don't want to anymore, even that often, um, is a mandatory reporting issue um, and because it's really important that we report these cases um, to the, you know, so that BLM and emergency services really knows that we're on it with our paperwork and that we're tracking these things and so that something doesn't come back to us in, in the end. So that's kind of the short answer, but shift leads and pilots will be able to kind of look at those individual cases. This just did. I just learned that there will be a medical manual in the Zendo, and you're and so when you shift, when you do a change of shift, have the medical person who's doing the medical lead before you go over it with you, including the radio protocols. It's, it's really it's re, sorry. Have the person who is the medical lead in the shift before you. If you're the medical lead, just sign out like we would in any other setting, any other medical setting. So make sure you know how to use the radio. Make sure you know what the protocols calls are. They're pretty straightforward, really. Okay, common sense prevails. Any last questions? All right, thanks guys. Thank you. All right, uh, next we have George Greer. George Greer, raise your hand. There you are. Great. So George Greer is a psychiatrist and medical director of the Hefter Research Institute. He administered MDMA to people in the 1980s before it was banned. This is like OG shit right here. <laughs> He's going to talk about uh, how to support someone who's having an overwhelming psychedelic experience. So it's really exciting. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about a subset of that and about what we call in psychiatry, counter-transference. And uh, I'm going to talk about counter-transference assuming that you haven't been to graduate school in psychology and therapy. Uh, counter-transference is the phenomenon of the therapist having feelings, thoughts, and emotions about the client 
that originate in the therapist's history and personality and are then uh, and then the therapist assumes it's about the patient but it's really coming from the therapist and it happens this happens you know this is part of human life we all do this and uh, and there's positive countertransference where it's it's a positive association and negative where it's it's like you know an aversion negative association so what's important I, I assume everyone here wants the best for the person going through their experience you want the best outcome uh, you know the best if they can have some therapeutic benefit from something they didn't really plan on that would be great so I assume that's everyone's intention everyone here's intention to do that so how do you know if a neurotic countertransference phenomenon is affecting your judgment and decision making about how you interact with the with the client with the person you're trying to help how, how, do, how do you know how do you know it's coming from you or from them or should I do this should I not do that so the way I recognize countertransference is if I'm having thoughts about uh, why did I say this or why did I not say this if I'm deliberating you know to do X or Y if I have a, a feeling and a feeling it's always accompanied by a body sensation and a feeling that's that's like pressure to either or, or I really, really want to do this I have this urgency uh, like repetitive thoughts like I should say this I should say this and I want to do that if there's if there's a pressure to it it's most likely countertransference coming from you. I mean, the feeling is in your body. So, so the simple way to think of it is, if you have a feeling that you feel in your body, it's your feeling. It's not their feeling. And um, some people might think, well, hey, I'm, you know, I have this feeling, but I'm, re I know I'm really intuitive. I'm a little psychic. I can kind of read the person. I can kind of feel what's going on inside them. I don't know, maybe. Um, I would say probably not. I don't know anybody who's reliably psychic. Um, so the first step is to recognize that, and I, I think if you ask yourself, if you just ask yourself that question, oh, I'm having a feeling to say, take a deep breath, or you're okay, or don't worry about it, or go through it, or anything. If, if you're having a feeling, just stop and just consider that it's not about them at all, that it's about you. Just take a moment and just con consider that option. And then, you know, with your sort of highest self-intuition, decide what you want to do. Because there's, there's no way to know for sure and um, if you just stop and consider, and then if they, you know, feel worse or whatever, at least you relieve yourself of, of the guilt of saying, oh, I screwed up, you know, I shouldn't have said that, you know. And then now you're distracted by your own process about what you did or didn't do, which takes you away from being present for the person going through the experience. And basically, I, I, I've never done this this work that you're doing. Uh, I think it's very brave and, and courageous, and, and uh, for you to do that because you have no you have no history with the person, you have no relationship with them, you haven't set an set an intention with them. You don't know anything. That you, they just show up, and and you're you know just running you know like your shirt sleeves just. You don't know what to do so it's a very courageous thing you're doing and it's important to recognize how little you know about that person and what they're going through and my uh, belief about people going through these things is that really uh, the, the process is far more complex unpredictable chaotic than is 
impossible to understand uh, and predict. And so I think the best approach is to just be present, have some kind of trust in the larger process of life, that it will go forward, that your intention for them will somehow be communicated to them that you're good, that you want the best for them, that whatever they do or express, no matter how disturbing or crazy or weird or, or shameful, uh, that you're not gonna judge them negatively about it, that they're free to experience, express in anything or not express. Uh, that they are the, um, that they are really the world's expert on themselves. And they know much more about themselves than, than you do. And um, if they get worse and worse, like an existential crisis and a, a guilt, guilt shame spiral, you know, I see no reason to try to stop that or divert it or, or direct it. Um, the only time I would say you need to direct someone is if they're doing some physical harm to themselves or someone else. Then you, know, then you have to stop them from hurting themselves or someone else. And that's, that's kind of obvious. But in terms of, they're talking about, I'm guilty, I'm ashamed, I'm bad, I blah, blah, blah. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with feeling shame. It's just a feeling. And, and especially with a psychedelic, it's, gonna, it's just moving. It's just going to keep moving. Um, yeah, I think that's the basic, the, the, the basic concept I want to convey. You know, check your feelings, check your body, get your ideas, stop and consider, uh, and then make your decision, and then no regrets. You know, then it's on. Okay, now this is what's going on. So, uh, I, I, 15 minutes is my whole time. Yeah, okay. That's the basic concept. So why don't I take some uh, questions or comments from people? Yeah. Um, this is somewhat, somewhat you know, stand up and speak really loud. This is uh, somewhat relevant. There are many points when we're sitting with an individual where we can see some personal experience or ourselves. I would recommend. If a person is, okay, the question is, uh, is it okay or a good idea to speak about anything from personal experience, like, like your own story of going through a difficult psychedelic time or something? Yeah. Uh, it's a good question because there's no pat answer. I would say uh, if someone is cognitively disorganized, can't put thoughts together in a coherent, coherent way, can't really engage in a meaningful conversation, can't listen and have uh, perspective and detachment and process information in a normal ego state, I wouldn't say anything about any of my history at all. Uh, it's so easy for people, especially on a psychedelic like LSD or psilocybin or hallucinogenic thing, to get into paranoia, delusional paranoia, you're the devil, you know, you're, oh, you're against me, or whatever, you know, oh, they just, you know, because they're already on their, their own fear thing going on, it's like, and they can put you into that view. So the safest thing is just don't talk, don't talk about your story. In, in any specific way, you can say, like, you can, you know, it's like, I've been through rough times, and I got through it. I think something like that's fine if, if they're in a conversational space. But but if you're talking about your specific story, then you're kind of putting your story in their head, and their head doesn't need any more information. It's already overwhelmed with information. They do not need to think about your story. And um, which which comes to another act, issue actually. Uh, really, before you do this, ask yourself. Uh, I mean, I, I know your intention is positive, but ask yourself at a, at a gut level, you know, your inner child, your inner four-year-old, 10-year-old, you know, 
And what's, I'm spending eight hours for shifts, right? Why are you spending eight hours at Burning Man to be at Zendo to help people when you could be out doing Burning Man? <laughs> no, really, what's in it for you at a gratification level? And um, if that is, I want to feel like I'm helping somebody, that can get in the way. You know, when I was in therapy, my, thera my therapist said, so are you attached to, to your healing the person as opposed to they just get well re regardless of what you do? And that was really cool. It's like, well, yeah, I kind of want to feel like, hey, I'm healing them so I have better self-worth. I'm worthy because I'm helping them. Well, that's about me. And I realized, well, you know, really, my highest self, I just want him to get better. And if I can help him, great. If, but if it has nothing to do with me, I still want him to get better. Because your des your desire for them to get better can interfere with him getting better. I guess that's, that's the point. So just, you know, just consider that. Any question? Yeah. Okay, so let's start with the, there's just a continuum, you know, like how, how, I'm sorry. The question is, if you're aware that you are having countertransference feelings toward the person that are, that are negative, that, what do you do? How do you handle that? Uh, how do you decide what to do if you're aware of it? Um, worst case scenario, it's, it's, it's how much is it distracting you if it's just in your mind all the time and, and you just can't think about anything else, ask someone else to come and help, be with you, take over, give you a break. It's not that bad, which it probably is not. Uh, just as best you can, just be present and don't say anything. Do your best to watch your feeling while you're present with him. But if, 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 if the decision is what's best for the client, is it best for them that I'm here half compromised doing this, or is it better if someone else comes and takes over, or are we, are we trained who we're working with so this other person don't trip them? You know, and, and there, there's is there always somebody kind of in charge at each ship? Yeah. So, like a supervisor kind of thing. Yeah. So ask. Yeah. If when in doubt, ask the person in charge. You know, talk it out with them, like, what do I do, this is going on, and, and they can, the two of you can figure it out a lot better than you can in your own head. Another question? Okay. You guys are ready, go for it. are going to talk about ethics and sitter self-care and Shannon will be up here. Shannon's a veteran volunteer, been um, working with the Zendo for a few years and she's also a, um, training to be a, ther she's a therapist on a study using M MDMA for anxiety related to terminal illness. Alright, here we've been throwing a lot of information at you, how are you doing? All right, sticking with it. Just take a second to just kind of stretch out any soreness, take a deep breath. I'm going to talk pretty briefly so I can catch up on some of our time. Um, I just want to give a recap of where we've been to kind of orient us. We're coming to an end of this part of the training. We're going to transition into a part with breakout groups. Um, and then say goodbye soon. Um, so we've covered the four psychedelic harm reduction principles. Uh, maybe you remember them. Creating a safe space. Sitting, not guiding. Talk through, not down. 
difficult is not the same as bad. To help you memorize it, I like to say safely sitting through difficulty. Um, so we've covered that. We've had some wonderful speakers in different areas of expertise come up, talk about some of the safety that we provide for um, guests who need more attention, medical or security, with the Rangers, with ESD, um, gotten some perspective from some therapists. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the ethics of peer-to-peer -peer counseling, which is what we're doing, um, and sitting with somebody while they're having a psychedelic experience, because they're in an altered space, usually a very vulnerable space. Um, people are highly suggestible when they're on a psychedelic. So we've talked about sitting, not guiding, that we aren't leading the experience, um, and also appreciating a guest's autonomy. So a few ethical principles, I'm not gonna go into the details of all of them, but just kind of highlight. Um, one thing is about how you show up for your shift. Um, in our breakout, we will talk a little bit more about the specific volunteer roles and what's expected of you. Veterans know this. Um, some of you newbies, it's kind of common sense. Um, when you're in a vulnerable, maybe panicked or overwhelmed state, not totally feeling safe, think about, just like we thought about what you want the space to look like, think about what you would want somebody sitting with you to be presenting. You probably wouldn't want a large naked man to say, hey, can I help you? This is the safe space. Um, that could be perceived as threatening to somebody. So we come clothed, um, at least covering your genitals and some private areas, sensitive areas that can be triggering for people. Um, wearing, not like I am, but hopefully wearing closed toed shoes, um, just because you don't know if you need to walk a guest to a porta potty or somebody runs and you need to chase them or somebody's stomping around just kind of for your protection. In general, almost every volunteer shift, no matter what you're doing, wants you to wear closed toed shoes. Um, and then I'll talk more about self care, what kind of things you can bring to help provide for yourself. So you're coming to your shift not only thinking about your commitment to Zendo, what you've signed up for, but also your service to the guest, but also what you're gonna need. You're gonna be eight plus hours away from home on the playa. So you've gotta think about those things. We'll go through that. Um, so where is part of the ethics? Touch. Um, you know, people can be very touching on psychedelics. And touch has an entire spectrum from brushed up against somebody to um, sexual contact. So sexual activities are absolutely not allowed in the Zendo. That goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it. It sometimes happens between guests or between a guest and a friend that comes, and we need to maintain that safe space and just, you know, without shaming, just kind of say, you know, this is a safe space we need to provide for everyone. We want to interact with you without any sexuality happening in this space. Can you please wait until you're ready to leave to engage sexually? So there's really, you know, kind of validating of that experience. It's not a bad thing, but this just isn't the place. So um, in that whole spectrum of touch, um, you've got to kind of figure out ethically what makes sense. Never touch a guest without asking. Um, that's just the basic. And the kinds of touch that you might ask about are, you know, would you like to hold my hand right now? Or I'm thinking I would like to give you a hug. Would you like a hug? Those kinds of things um, are appropriate. Massage, not really appropriate. Um, so kind of use your best judgment, check in with your shift if you're not sure, but definitely asking for consent. If a person's nonverbal and can't consent, just don't touch them. Because um, you don't want somebody coming out of their experience the next morning and saying, I came in here to sit in this safe place and somebody was touching me when I wasn't even conscious. Um, so just being careful of that. Um, other ethics are not practicing outside of your bounds, your expertise. So, and then there are even some limitations on that. So I'm training to be a licensed psychotherapist, but I'm not doing psychotherapy in the Zendo. I could, but that's not what we're offering. So if you're a Reiki master or a yoga instructor, you know there might be some parts of what you do that you could offer to guests, but you probably wanna check in with the shift lead. Generally, we aren't doing Reiki or healing arts. We're, we wanna keep it really simple. The most profound thing is how simple this is, is you can sit and feed with somebody, and that can transform their whole experience. You don't have to do tricks or anything. You just have to sit and be with them for the most part. Listening. Um, so don't practice outside of your bounds, and, and other people have touched on don't practice outside of what 
your energy is right now. If you're, you know, hour nine, you were supposed to get off an hour ago, you're still sitting with somebody and you haven't eaten and you need some water and you need to use the restroom, you need to tap out. Um, it's not serving you, but it's not serving them. So, so those are kind of the basics, the very short part about ethics. Um, and also that this is kind of an opportunity for us to learn from each other. So if you see something another sitter is doing or you're not quite sure about something, go to your shift lead and make a comment. Because shift leads can't see everything at all one time. There might be 30 people when you count guests and sitters in the Zendo at one moment. So if you see something that doesn't look quite right, whether it's with a guest or with another volunteer, tell your shift lead. That's better actually than going up to the volunteer because they might be in the middle of something. Um, the shift lead is kind of the manager. They will check in and make sure things that aren't supposed to be happening, but that they check on that. Quickly moving along, I'm going to talk about self-care. So when you're packing your bag and your shift is in half an hour, we already talked about clothes, but you know what you would do if you were going to go out for a night on the playa. You would pack warm things and layers and lots of water, um, chapstick and you know, you're going to be at the Zendo for eight hours, you're, you know, we encourage you to take breaks during that time, but you're not going to have a half hour, hour long lunch break, and you're probably not going to have enough time to go back to camp and get food. So those are things to consider too. Eight hours is a long time. Please ask for breaks. Even if you're sitting with one guest the whole time, check in with the guest. Hey, look, um, I'm you know, really happy to be here, be supportive. In order to keep doing that, I need to take five to 10 minutes away how, how does that feel for you? Is now an okay time to do that? This this other person is going to step in and, and just be around if you need me, if you need somebody until I come back. Check in with your shift lead anytime before you leave the though. Whether it's for a break, whether it's for the end of your shift, whether you're taking a guest to the bathroom. The shift lead needs to kind of account for everyone who's there, volunteers and guests. Um, other parts of self-care before your shift, um, consider what kind of sleep you need to get, what kind of food you need to eat, shower, please show up to the Zendo somewhat clean, at least not offensively smelly, because um, people on psychedelics are very, very sensitive to smell sometimes. Um, and the foam experience is here starting to happen tomorrow, so you have no excuse. Um, uh, what else about self-care? Sleep. So what I like to do is, you know, I'm a planner, so this comes naturally to me, but I look at my calendar, yeah, I have a calendar for Burning Man, and I look at all my shifts and I figure out what nights I can play, and how many hours after I'm done playing, I need to recover to sleep for whatever I took the night before to wear off. Um, so you, I really encourage you to have that kind of forethought, um, because if you, on a whim, 11 p.m. before a 6 a.m. shift decide to take something that's quite strong and is not going to wear off before 6 a.m., you're going to have a rough shift, and you're going to know. Um, and if there's nothing bad about it. We're not your parents, but we need you to show up being present. And that's what you've committed to, and, and that's what we commit to as um, pilots and shift leads. That being said, if something happens, a, a breakup, an injury, a, yeah, whatever it is, allergies, we had somebody with a major nut allergy last year and came to us. He's like, I can't work my shift. We're like, whoa, you need to go to the emergency room. Thank you for checking in with us. So we understand why it happened. Um, basically what I'm trying to say is communication, forethought, intention, um, being aware of, of yourself, your body, and people around. One thing I forgot to say, part of self-care is this year for the first time I've helped um, our coordinators set up debrief groups for volunteers. You probably saw an email, I'm just going to say this really quickly. Um, for you to help integrate the experience after Burning Man, we've set up a series of events, some are in person, some are online um, video calls, to help you talk about maybe some difficult guests you sat with or what you know now, what do you do afterwards, how do you process that kind of intensity, it can be intense. So look at your email when you get back home or come see me after this training. I have a sign up. Thanks. Thank you, Shannon. So on the note of um, self-care, we want to let you all know that our veteran volunteer, Shilo, will be providing a couple of uh, holotropic breathwork workshops during the week. 
um, this is a really good time to come and receive and um, just relax and experience holotropic breath work, especially if you haven't before, but if you have as well. Um, those two workshops, and we'll have these um, times and dates posted in the Zendo um, so that you can all look at them Thursday at Palenque Norte from 10 to 1, and Friday right here from 9 to 12. And where will that be, Sheila? In this space. In this space from 9 to 12. Great, thank you. Is Sage around? Sage? Okay, um, so in a second here, we are going to transition into our breakout groups. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a, a few groups meeting. We're going to be meeting in this space, and we're going to, um, in a moment, I'll, I'll um, instruct on how to get in your groups. Um, we're going to have one group that's going to be the medical leads, medical volunteers, um, and then all of the other groups are going to be groups of 10 volunteers and one shift lead. So in a moment, I'll um, tell you guys how we're gonna do that. We just wanna take a moment first to thank everybody, thank all of the speakers who came today, um, all of you for being here. And thank you again to Something Freaky This Way Films Camp and hosting us here. Uh, so we will, um, as I said earlier, the pilots, we will all be available this week for any questions. In line with sitter self-care, you know, stuff emerges and comes up for, for volunteers all the time. So we are here to support you in that. Um, so please know that we are available. If you have any questions, if things come up for you, if there's things that you need to process, we are around uh, to support you in, in this role that you're taking on, which is a really big and important role here. So thank you. Uh, just as a, a couple words in, in closing, Stan Groff um, talks about how emergence, uh, psychedelic emergence and emergency are two sides of the same coin. So what we might see as an emergency could actually be a personal awakening. Uh, psychedelics reveal us to ourselves and that includes all of ourselves, both our dark and our light. This can be seen through the lens and the archetype of the hero's journey which symbolizes the transformation that can occur when we enter into the darkness. And in fact, within the darkness is where our light hides. The darkness and the shadow, we all have it. In this moment, each of you can touch into that part of yourselves that feels frightened or insecure or just not quite right. We all have that part of ourselves. And, and psychedelics really help us learn where we're holding back where we're not being true to our hearts. So if we can help guests approach this shadow and darkness with curiosity and love rather than fear and aggression, it can unfold and reveal our own unique radiance and gifts. And it, it's our hope that these services will start to be integrated into safety infra infrastructure at events, festivals all over the world. And we really thank all of you for being part of the family and helping to make that happen. So thank you.